Salo falava, ma lo le sue fu, maua ma le langi e mamma. Mi sambo le vinaka, che muni saka na wikanda mai viti. Hello everyone and welcome to Talano Tupe. This is a show where we celebrate and highlight Pacifica's success in all its many forms. Each week we sit down with a different Pacific thought leader to hear about their journey and learn from their experience. Our guest today is one of the preeminent Pacific entrepreneurs in New Zealand. Fiso John Fiso. He is the chair of the Pacific Cooperation Foundation and Pacific Health Plus, the only Pacific healthcare provider in Porirua. He's also the chair of Whitby Collegiate, a private school ranked among the top 10 academic schools in New Zealand. Before we sit down with our guest, let's see how we go with our Blue Pacific quiz. Kia ora. Talofa lava. My name is Tosini. And my name is Telesia. And, and we, we are, are members, members of the Pacific, Pacific Social Justice, Justice League. League. And we're going to give you a quiz on our blue Pacific. Let's go. Can you tell us which country this flag belongs to? Can you tell us the capital of this country? Can you tell us the name of the leader of this country? And lastly, can you tell us what currency they use in this country? Stick around to the end of the show so we can compare our answers. See you soon. Thank you, Tilisia and Tosivi. I look forward to those answers at the end of the show. Up next, let's hear about Pacific literature, presented by my good friend, Leilani Tamu. My name's Leilani Tamu. I'm a writer and an editor, and I'm passionate about Pacific books. The book I have for you today is called Māori Ola Contemporary Polynesian Poems in English, Fetu Moana 2. It's edited by Albert Wendt, Raina Faitiri and Robert Sullivan. And it's the second book in a series that focuses on Polynesian poems in English. The first was Fetu Moana, which was published in 2003. This one was published in 2010. I really love this anthology because I think as, particularly as Polynesians, but also I think as Pacifica peoples, we are so poetic and it comes through in our proverbs and in our songs and our ability to translate those ideas and metaphors into English concepts, I think is something to be celebrated because it's about us taking the language that's been introduced to this region and turning it into something that we own and that actually we indigenize. I really love this book. For me, it's empowering. And as the title says, Mauriola, the breath of life, the way of living and breathing and the ownership of that space. It's a really powerful book and I highly recommend it. If you're interested in more of my reviews or would like to contribute a review, please check out my website. I'd love to hear your ideas for future books I could think about reviewing. Thank you, Lelani. After the break, we're joined by preeminent Pacific entrepreneur, Fiso John Fiso a long-time advocate for improving economic, education and health outcomes for Pacifica. Welcome back to Talanoa Tupe. I'm here with Fiso John Fiso, one of the preeminent Pacific entrepreneurs in New Zealand and a long-time advocate for improving outcomes for Pacifica. Salo falava lawa fionga Fiso. Welcome to the show. Happy to be here. 
First of all, there's so much we want to unpack in this interview, given your advocacy for um, improving out outcomes for Basifika. Mm. Um, but first, uh, can we talk about education? Because that sure. seems to be a very consistent theme throughout your life and career mm. and a service for which you were awarded an ONZM. Mm. Mm. What was it that your parents instilled in you and your eight siblings, uh, which meant that you could all find success in your respective fields? Well, I think uh, there's a parallels between our family and probably your own family, Tupi, with um, uh, uh, their education journey. And I think the, the reality is when you've got parents who value education, you know, uh, that goes through the whole family. So not only the parents, I had um, uh, a moral compass set by a lot of my uncles and aunties who were in the church, mm. pretty much like your family. And also we had older siblings who went through uh, college and university who set the standard for us. Mm. And so I would say there's, it's not just our parents, but obviously primarily our parents because they wanted to give us a better life coming out from the Pacific Islands in the early 50s mm. to give their children a better opportunity. So that's the first thing. They had aspire, aspirations to improve the lives of their, their kids. Mm. And I think apart from that, then they had the extended family who also helped and supported our aspirations to get through. Six of us went to university and, and got university qualified. And I think... Uh, Back then, that was unusual. But when you look at the, the how it happened, I think um, little decisions like we were part of the Methodist Church, the uh, PIC Church, to start off with the new town, but we couldn't understand the language. So my father actually sent us to the Baptist Church, which was an English-speaking church. And I think from there, we started to do Bible readings. We talked to other uh, non-Pacific people. And so we got a bit of a, a, a different view of, of how other people thought and we got to read things in English and probably improved our, our, our own experiences. So apart from them, we had um, my older brother and sister, I credit them a lot. My older sister became a senior manager at the Ministry of Education, um, a teacher that I taught with as well, um, and my older brother who was in, ultimately ended up as an inspector in the police and, and doing a whole lot of things in the Pacific. But they were sort of uh, led the way for us. So a lot of it is your parents mm. provide the opportunity and then your your siblings lead the way and so I just went to college and followed what they did and he was he was unusual because he played badminton you know he was in the Marty Cup rowing eight you know which for a Pacific Islander back then was unheard of um, you know they also valued education as well um, and won a career so I think that set the pathway for the, the rest of the siblings. Um, I had a, an uncle who was the the president of the Methodist Church in Samoa but he got posted to uh, Belgium as part of the United Council of Churches. And I, I used to talk to him a lot. And uh, I remember getting school certificate and him giving me my first gold Parker pen for getting my school certificate. I think that was a, another key moment for me going, well, you know, this is a good pathway. But so it was a range of people, but I do um, want to credit my parents for actually valuing education and giving us the opportunities that a large family of eight uh, uh, did. That's extraordinary. It sounds like you had very strong parental support and very strong support from your community. Definitely. I'm still paying for it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so in, in your experience, so you've been a teacher, uh, you've run one of the most uh, recognisable private training establishments in New Zealand, and now you're the chair of one of the top ranked private schools in New Zealand. Mm. So if you were to sort of boil down sort of what are the, characteristics um, that um, can really maximise a child's chance for success? Well, I think uh, we have a, we're we living in a complex world. And um, the reason why we, myself and, and your parents, set up these private training establishments was because there wasn't an option for a lot of Pacific children. And they weren't being successful at schools. So by virtue of the fact that they were being unsuccessful, there needed to be a new model. And so the PT has provided that new model, provided a whole lot of other opportunities for kids that might have slipped through the cracks. Now, um, if I transfer that to where we started like that, and then we got certificates, diplomas, and bachelor programs, because we decided to create these pathways that could go internationally as well. So, you know, we, we expand based on what we think are the challenges at the time. Now, back then, it, it wasn't... It wasn't uh, uh, great to be a Pacific Islander in schools. Now, our results were terrible. Mm. Um, so these alternative schools needed to happen. Just like when we had this new uh, this new entity, this private school, it's an independent school, and it's in a 
mainly European area. It's one of the top 10 academic schools, Whitby Collegiate, in the country. But you know, to be fair, we have a philosophy of changing again. We want a whole lot of kids to get access to that very good education. Mm -hmm. So part of that is, an, is not actually being exclusive, but trying to be inclusive. So it's actually the same model we had with the NZIS and the PTE sector. We're just opening up to a secondary uh, system that has probably become a little bit, uh, uh, you know, exclusive. They, they run what I would say is qualifications like Cambridge, IB, which are international qualifications from Europe coming back in. And what we value is, well, actually, we quite value the New Zealand view of the world going out. Mm -hmm. And we actually don't want to be uh, looking down on other people. We want to actually make sure they can get access yeah. to this high-quality education. So if you're one of the top 10 academic schools in the country, we want more kids to get access to it, not less. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's the change in dynamic. Now, that was a community that came and saw me in uh, Queensland on my my holiday. So five parents flew down to me and suggested that I want pick up Whitby Collegiate. Um, once I see, I saw the school, saw the children the, and the parents, what we've got is, is the same with the Pacific parents, they value education and that's all they want. They want, a, they want a choice that matches their own kids' aspirations and their own view. It's a faith-based school and we, we like the fact that it's faith-based. A lot of Pacific Islanders uh, want their kids their faith-based education but it's increasingly becoming a uh, reduced amount of options. Mm. And you know, then a lot of the schools are specifically a particular denomination. And so you know, uh, that limits it again. So we've said it's a faith-based school, we value care, and we're trying to be progressive, not looking back, like we picked it up from a school that was, uh, it was a 140-year-old school. Uh, we want to be a modern school, mm. um, but still excellent. Mm. So I, I think it's the same challenges, but different different uh, communities. Yeah. So what you're talking about on the one hand is you need the parents and communities to have high aspirations for their children. And at the same time, we need the system to be more equitable and accessible and inclusive. Exactly. Because I think the, the, the reality is, okay, there's a whole range of schools out there. But if I was a parent, I'm going to pick the school that's going to best meet the requirements of my child, son or daughter. And that can be for a whole range of reasons. Because we're not, as we learned in the PTE sector, one size doesn't exactly, fit all. Yeah. So you need a whole lot of choices because some people will find our school great and others will find the community school down the, down the road great. Mm. And, but you need the choices for parents to make those decisions. Mm. Um, so you've talked a bit about... Um, how P the PTEs, private training establishments, were a response to poor outcomes in education. Um, and you've talked a bit about, um, you know, changing the system to make it more um, equitable and accessible. You've spoken about uh, your disappointment um, in some people who you feel should be speaking up more on disparities for Pacifica in education, housing, um, and in other areas. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, I think it's more about the, how we construct where we get the information from, from Pacifica. Because you notice that a lot of uh, agencies have Pacific advisory groups. But at the end of the day, they are generally, uh, there's a lot of consultants in there. They're paid by the agencies. So what we want is independence. We need to have the, where the, the ideas coming from the ground up and the outside in. But when you appoint them, if you look at the structure of these advisory groups, they're full of consultants, they're paid by the agencies. So you, you've got a tainted view of the world. What we want is indep real independence, where someone can challenge, have robust and say, well, actually, that's not good enough. Or, uh, and, and I think that's a key for how we uh, uh, progress it. Our, and so, you know, to be fair, I'm, I'm, I'm continually turning on the radio and the TV and seeing uh, commentators from the Pacific. But they, they talk about uh, we need to be consulted and things like that, when really I'm interested in what are you going to do to fix it? Mm. You know, we shouldn't be talking about these small things. We should be talking about, it comes down to resourcing, it comes down to be meaningful engagement, which is one of the things, but but we, 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 we are not in the decision-making groups. Mm. So I, I think we should take a much more strategic approach to it. And it's, it's uh, not talk, but action. And we should measure the requirements that we, uh, based on what resources are provided and how meaningful the engagement is. Because mm. we've got a whole lot of advisory groups all over the place, but they're all at the, you know, 
at this level, and and to be fair, they've got very little influence on the outcome. So if we could focus on um, one of the areas where there are uh, poor outcomes for Pacifica, um, and that's in the area of health. So the New Zealand Medical Journal uh, found that 50% of all Māori and Pacifica deaths are uh, potentially avoidable in comparison to 23% for non-Māori and non-Pacifica. So you're the chair of um, the only Pacific health provider in Porirua. What do you think can be done to turn this around? It's, it's uh, structural. It's, um, a lot of it is institutional. Um, but there has to be significant change because, you know, I, I, I was talking to another media group the other week and there's something wrong after you have COVID. After all the statistics that Pacific have, we are at the bottom of most, bar no one, in terms of job losses, um, underlying con health conditions, uh, poor housing, we are at the bottom. Yet we only received two times more the resources when we had the first lockdown. Mm. Whereas Māori received four times the resources and Europeans or mainstream received three times resources. Now, if you base it on need, it should have been the other way around. Mm. So here, here again, as a, as a, as a uh, the, the, but the other thing is with it is we have to do our own thing in terms of advocacy. And that's what I'm saying is the Pacific have to, if they want to, no community around the world got anywhere without struggle. And so you can't be silent. You've actually got to say what you want and articulate it in a manner that other people listen to it. But we are a silent group. We, we tend to rely on our ministers and our church leaders to advocate for us. And um, you know, to be fair, there's a fair amount of agreeableness. And I think what we've got to change is we, we can't be agreeable, we've got to be more assertive. Mm. And so it's a different way of looking at things. And it is part cultural, but every civilization over history that hasn't evolved and changed and is, is, hasn't done too well. Yeah, I think it's probably fair to say there's uh, maybe a cultural reluctance to appear that um, we're not being grateful, that we're not, um, uh, you know, that we're complaining. Uh, whereas, I mean, what you seem to be talking about is, you know, we can still, um, you know, say things and be respectful, but be clear about what we want. I think you'll look at it, if this is your family and your family's health and their ability to be alive and well, then I think you would take a you would you would fight for your own family. Mm. So we've got to take that attitude to when we're talking because actually they are affected. Mm. And um, you know, like we thought we were doing great in the first lockdown, but actually you'd probably argue there wasn't a lot of um, transmission mainly because you know we're in South Auckland, we're in Poirua, those aren't places where tourists or a lot of outside um, international people come to. So was it luck or was it? Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of early testing going on. Mm. And so we've, we've got to be a lot more uh, discerning about how we advocate for these things. Could we uh, talk about another type of disparity um, which has uh, been discussed in New Zealand media and that's the ethnic wealth gap. Uh, so um, I'm really interested in your views about this as someone who uh, has created and is investing wealth. Um, so just for a bit of context, uh, the, uh, according to Statistics New Zealand, the wealth of the average Pākehā is 138,000 and uh, all of the other ethnic groups are much further behind and right at the bottom of the list is Pasifika. Uh, the average Pasifika has 15,000 in wealth, uh, which means that the gap between Pākehā and uh, Pasifika is 123,000. So you uh, are the director of a multi-million dollar um, investment group. Mm. What do you think um, needs to change to close that gap? Well, I think the the challenge for us is the actual solutions are with the Pacific communities, because part of it is a complete change in the way that we look at the world. Um, we are again a society that that is feudal in nature. You know, if you look at our structures, we we rely on the chiefs, title holders, and church ministers to make a lot of our decisions, and and you know. It doesn't allow for a lot of innovation and a lot of new ideas coming in. So that the ability to change is, is a tough one for Pacific. So that means we've got to change how we think because we don't, we don't have high levels of financial literacy. Uh, we don't have a lot of savings. Uh, we don't make too many comments about the economy or finance. 
But all of those things add up to why you would change your behaviour. Because if I knew a lot more about savings, if I knew a lot more about investments, if I knew, take a view on the pr prices in the local shops, or I take a view in my wage packet, you know, people say, well, you don't have any finance experience. No, everyone's got finance mm -hmm. experience. You just have to look at what happens in your daily life. I'm going to make a comment about prices, my income, mortgages, interest rates. So that builds a wealth of knowledge that means that you can start to make informed decisions. But if you don't, if you, if you don't look at those things, you're always going to be in the dark. Mm -hmm. And so if I look at my journey through university and you know what I've learned, is I've learned a lot from other people, non-Pacific. And you know, uh, I think that's a, that's a good thing. We can't get all the good ideas from ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I'll be able to look outside in and go, well, actually, what are the changes? We actually need to ramp, ramp up the education system. Because, and the education system needs to be tweaked to represent real life circumstances. Like you can go through the whole five years of secondary school and not learn anything about financial literacy. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you don't have an investment strategy. Whereas I, I look at the the um, students that my son's with in Canterbury University, they've already linked into sharesies. They're already putting $10, $20 into the share market. You know, they went to the bank and started looking at their flat finish share, but they were investigating how to buy the house. You know, these aren't, these aren't things that our Pacific groups would normally think about. But I think the other thing about it is, you know, wealth is generated over generations. Mm. And we can't forget that either. Like, you know, how Europeans have got wealthy is because their parents buy a house, they then, when they pass away, they divvy up the house to their kids. There's an asset there they can mm. build on, then the next generation can build on that asset. And it's over time that you accumulate these assets. But we are quick to, we take a, a, a um, feast and famine approach to our finances. We've got some money today and we've got some fat love lovers, we will spend it. And we all know that we don't save a lot. But actually, if we thought about it, that's the only way that we can build wealth over time is if we have to have a savings program. Mm. But the other thing is we have to earn more money. Mm. So we're all in we're we're heavily entrenched in the lowest paid jobs, entry level jobs, yeah. retail, hospitality, security, and again, it's a dollars for hours type uh, wage which doesn't give you exponential growth. Mm. So when you own the business, and that's why I'm encouraging you under, you know, we can jump over a whole lot of the institutional barriers if we're in the private sector. Mm. Economies and communities offshore who have done well with, with you know, reasonably disadvantaged communities. But once they are hooked onto the private sector, they run small businesses, they, they can jump over the barriers of racism, institutional racism, because people just want the products and services. So I'm, I'm a great supporter of the private sector, but we don't talk about the private sector. It's almost bad to talk about money in the Pacific. Mm. And so that holds us back a little bit. Whereas what we want to do is, is hold up the people who've got this, because if I look at my instance and my cousins, his daughter's a, a chef, you know, Monique Fiso, who's got a, a high-end yes, chef yes. Um, business. He runs a, a reasonable business himself. He's employed all of his brothers and sisters, his cousins, same with us. We have employed ours. And what you find is that when Pacific people own their own businesses, they tend to pay more than the average. They tend to look after those people that they've got because they're generally family and, and, and relations. So you've got this, this well-being that's created from people owning their own destiny mm -hmm. rather than working for someone else who normally when there's a redundancy, there's a, there's a lockdown, who gets cut first? It's the Pacific. Fiso, there's so many nuggets in there that I want to... Um, <laughs> I want to explore further, but we've got to take a break. Um, yes. But when we come back, uh, let's explore these uh, themes further. Now for part two of our masterclass on wealth with Fisor John Fisor. Fisor, you mentioned uh, that some of our attitudes need to change um, around money in order for us to uh, really progress and to start creating wealth for ourselves. What are the attitudes you think that need to change that are not working for us well in the New Zealand context? Well, we're, we're, we're a collective community. You know, we, we don't like to have, raise our head above the, the rest of the group. And I found that in school teaching, you know, all the Polynesian kids would all be down the back hungering in their groups. And our job was trying to split them up, bring them up to the front. And I think the, um, that, that does hold us back because we want innovation to succeed. You need individuals 
who were going to take a risk and put their hand up and promote an idea and then develop it, irrespective of where the rest of the group agrees. So if you look at all of the wealth creation around the world of Facebook and all the social media companies, guys who some didn't even finish university, but they had an idea and they, they promoted it when everyone else was going, no, that's not too flash. And, and I think that when I was on the um, core commodities group at NCQA, one of the interesting things we found was that it's actually the abnormal kids, the kids who are not normal, who actually achieve the best. And so that's why you've got to, you've got to cultivate individuality at a, at a time when Pacific are collected. Mm. But they have to have the freedom to go, no, I'm going to risk this. Yes. You know, and uh, um, so that's one, one, one challenge in terms of the, the culture. But I think also, you know, parents, my, my parents, when I set up the NZIS, I quit my, you know, head of department's job at the secondary school and the whole family was, you know, aghast because, you know, I've gone from a nice job, yeah. you know, with a nice salary, what they thought was a nice salary, to nothing. But I was taking a risk. Now, if I didn't take that risk, I wouldn't be talking to you about that. I'd be talking to you about getting my vaccine or something, you know. So, so I think, you know, the ingredients of being successful in business and growing wealth are about individuals taking a chance and being able to risk. And the other thing is with it is that Pacific don't necessarily have the capital to risk. So because they, you know, the parents can't give them 20000 and say, look, you're going to have a crack with our business over there. So what we have to do then is we've got to recognise that just like we've come together for a love, love you, we've got to come together and back a person who's going to go, I want to start up a, mm-hmm. a retail business or, and collectively get the money together and give them 20000 and back them, yeah. you know, because then they'll go and find the first investment strategy is friends and family. Then it's angel investors. They might find someone who's going to put in 50 grand. Then it's, you know, venture capitalists. You might put in 200 grand. Mm. Then it's private equity. You might put in a million. So they've got to have the scaled up version that goes all the way to grow the, to grow a big business. Mm. And I think that, that's, a, well, we've got to start with friends and family. And that's a tough one. We've got to encourage our families to go, look, invest in this person who's got this great idea. Now, you might have to, you know, they might fail. In fact, chance that they will fail, but you've got to go through that process to get them to, you know, be successful. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's taking a concept that we're familiar with, yes. like the pooling of resources, yes. and instead of using it for, you know, celebrations or for, um, you know, funerals and weddings and things like that, using it for something that could yeah. have the chance of bringing greater prosperity to the family. Exactly. So it's a bit like giving your credit card and spending it on the credit card. Well, it's a good spend and bad spend. So that's a bad spend, but investing is 20000 in someone's aspirations in your family, mm. that is a chance of growing a whole lot of other things. Yeah. But it will take a mind shift, though, because I think, um, <laughs> you know, for a lot of um, children of the migration, we came here um, and, you know, have benefited from our parents' and grandparents' sacrifice and what they wanted for us was... Uh, I guess a lot of them, a lot of us have been encouraged into stable jobs, yes. you know, as you say, but uh, it's about, I, I think, making the money work for us instead of us working for the money. Correct. <laughs> I, I think we've got to have the risk takers. We've got to develop the risk takers. And um, I think the the whole adage of, you know, we, we also want all our sons and daughters to be lawyers and doctors. It's still the case, you know, but but it is changing. But man, that, that whole world of future work has changed completely. Mm. Like, you know, the, what we, our parents might have thought 20 years ago was appropriate is now no longer appropriate. Mm. You know, we should talk about robotics, machine learning, you know, digital uh, uh, services, all those things. Yeah. Um, we, we, we've got to look, look forward. And um, so that does require a significant step change. Because yeah. we don't even know what jobs will exist no. in the future when our kids graduate. Well, I think we have, we're starting to get a fair idea. We're starting to see where the technology, you know, this, this, the STEAM, mm. science, technology, engineering, arts, and, and maths, well, they are becoming significantly more important. And I think um, things like healthcare uh, is becoming much more important. So, so we should take this thing. So when we parents look at it, they go, where are the industries that are going to grow? Mm. You know, to be fair, we can automate accountants. We can automate lawyers. So you'd actually say, Maybe we shouldn't be so so bullish on those. 
Fiesel, in July, you were appointed the chair of the Pacific Corporation Foundation, which works to grow connectivity between Pacific nations. Um, now that we're in lockdown, borders are closed, and a lot of um, businesses across the Pacific are suffering financially. Uh, what is PCF doing to help support Pacific businesses in New Zealand and across the region? Mm. Well, first thing, PCF is, a, um, is the voice of the Pacific. It's a connector, enabler, uh, because you've got a few other organisations. You've got Pacific Trade and Invest that looks at Pacific Trade into New Zealand. You've got Pacific Business Trust that looks at domestic business. Um, so you've, you've got some other organisations that, that do some things in the Pacific. But what we're trying to do is broker um, you know, arrangements that, that are future focused. So at the moment we're focusing on, look, we're talking about opening up the bubble. But actually, you know, we've got to say, well, why did you not discuss opening up the bubble first with the realm countries? Mm -hmm. Because they are New Zealanders. But you started yes. talking about opening it up with Australia first. And you talk about bringing home all these uh, New Zealanders from offshore, but you've forgotten about the three realm countries who are actually our New Zealanders. Mm. So, you know, we, we are advocating for that. The other thing is, when you're talking about opening up the bubble and trade, you know, those are economic terms, right? But actually, are we, you know, that, that's good for the, the businesses are trading. But if you think about what's happening in the Pacific, we're probably looking at a humanitarian issue, not a, not a, a, a trade issue. Mm. There's a whole lot of people who probably are struggling to feed themselves. So are we talking about trade when you've got some companies who might do well out of it? Or are we looking at both trade and humanitarian? Mm. You know, why is it that we don't have freight being able to get to the Pacific? Our freight numbers have dropped significantly. So we should be trying to open up more ways of getting the freight there. Remittances. The banks are, you know, to be fair, charging quite a bit for, for small amounts of money to go across the Pacific, but they, those amounts of money are significant. Yes. So we're looking at the fintech options of seeing what are the things that we can do to maybe circumvent the banks and have a finance structure, which means that you know we can increase emergencies without increasing the costs. We can increase freight forwarding to make sure it's more efficient and, and therefore getting the products and services and the people who are most interested and have our biggest investment in helping our Pacific, which is their own families. Mm. So it's quite a different, you know, it's a dual role that we're playing. And I know what one from an economic development private sector background, but I understand that this requires a different model. So, uh, you know, we're on lockdown anyway. And if you think about what's coming out of the Pacific to New Zealand, it's pretty minimal. 130 million was the, the uh, total trade. Now, that is not enough to sustain all those Pacific countries. Mm. We're heavily reliant on foreign aid. But foreign aid is, is, is only uh, at the behest and, and of the donors. So we've got to build a new structure that, you know, we, we look at how do we build a, a banking system that goes from people here in Australia and America to the people in the Pacific. Mm. An alternative route to going to government, foreign aid coming down. Yeah, helping people to help themselves. I think so. And, and, and I think being creative about it mm. and being pragmatic about it because, you know, I think, you know, people have got to realise that New Zealand is also in high stress. Mm. You know, so when people talk about sending 750 million as part of the Pacific reset back to the Pacific, most New Zealanders think, why are we giving 750 million to the Pacific? When actually that 750 million is using, is being used to bolster our own security, our own capability at, at our agencies and borders to respond to the Pacific. It's not actually we're giving them 750 mm. million. Mm. So people in New Zealand might, might misinterpret that as being handouts to them. But we already give 600 million in aid, so which you, you're going to do one way or the other. You're better off putting in the productive sector mm -hmm. and let them um, trade out of this issue. If you saw that in the Pacific, um, there's a lot of attention that's given to our vulnerability and our disadvantages. And that is important because we need to know what the barriers are in order to overcome them and know what interventions are needed. But what do you think? Uh, our strengths and our advantages that we really need to play up and emphasise at work and at school to help us get ahead? Well, I think at times of emergency, like you look at when we had the first uh, lockdown, you know, Pacific families are an extended family. They look after each other, everyone checks on everyone else. A lot of us are living together in the same households. So the, the collective rule to help each other is, you know, I think is something we can be proud about. Because if you look at what's happening in other communities, you know, isolation and um, not being able to access other people is, is a big problem. But for Pacific, it isn't. 
But at this time, when we've got these challenges of the largest number of, because the layoffs and the redundancies disproportionately hit Pacific. You know, health conditions disproportionately health hit Pacific. Mm. Housing inequities disproportionately hit Pacific. Mm. So when you put all those together, you know, they are New Zealanders. And let's mm. not forget, we talk about Pacific, but they're Pacific New Zealanders. And if they're in need, then it should be based on need that we allocate the resources. So that's what we should be advocating about. You know, and so right, when I say, you know, if this group gets four times more, this group gets three times more, if I look at what the disadvantages are and the needs, it should be significantly more uh, uh, increased for Pacific. Mm. Um, but the, the other part of it is we have to change ourselves. We, we, the best helping hand that we can give ourselves is the one at the end of our own hand. We, we, we must take the challenge and go, we've got to figure out some problems, we, uh, the solutions. We can't just go back, revert back to our old system of sitting around in circles and, you know, trying to get consensus. Mm. You know, because if you look at how the world solves their problems, it's normally some innovation comes, like for the, for the um, uh, tracing. You know, Sam Morgan puts out a, a, a digital device that can help the whole thing. Uh, you know, to me, that's crazy. We should be using that because that's going to automatically have everyone, you know, uh, uh, traced. But we're not doing it. But but across the world, the vaccines will be someone will find the vaccine because they've gone out and taken a risk, and and therein lies our issue. We have to be risk takers, and and get out of the way that we do things. We, we, our own culture can work for us in these emergencies, but they can work against us in terms of finding solutions and getting us forward. Mm. Well, you've given us some really great um, food for thought and some great suggestions about how we can take aspects of our culture and, mm. and apply them uh, to help us find success uh, in New Zealand and abroad. So thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you, Tupi. I look forward to being back on. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs>
In our next segment, we call on parenting experts from the Martin Hattis Foundation Trust, which has been running parenting courses since 2010. Talofa ladies. My name is Marita Solomon. And I'm Tale Solomon Moore. And so for the last 10 years, we've been delivering a parenting program um, that focuses on a different idea each week to help our parents um, build more positive communication and bond with their children. Uh, because parenting is the most important job that one will ever do. However, our precious gifts do not come with a manual. So that's our aim each week to build more positive communication and bond. The tip for this week is to offer low-cost rewards to encourage change in behaviour. Give the reward once the behaviour has changed. Your time is the best and biggest reward that you can give. Other low-cost rewards is a walk to the park, a trip to the library, extra screen time, playing outside or movie night. You can use the first and then idea, which goes like this. First, pick up your toys and then we'll go to the park. First state the behaviour you want to change or that you want them to do, then state the reward you are offering. Important that you wait for the behaviour to change before you give the reward and also that you're able to give the reward because if you don't give the reward straight away, your child will remind you every day. Thank you for joining us. If you would like to know more about Martin Houters Foundation Trusts, you can like our Facebook page and see the details on the screen. Thank you for that awesome tip. Okay, let's see how we did on the quiz. Please take it away to Lucia and to a CV. Welcome back to the PSGL quiz. Let's compare our answers. This flag belongs to Nauru. There is no official capital, but Yarran District is the de facto capital. The currency of Nauru is the Australian dollar. The leader of Nauru is President Lionel Aini Mir. Thank you for joining us and hope you did well. If you want to join the Pacific Social Justice League, follow us on our social media platforms. Mother. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Now to end our show, we have the sweet sounds of Soul Brown and the Soul Sisters. Fafetsai tere lava mo le tato po lo kolame le nei aso. Soi fua, ma ia manuia. See you next time on Talano Watupe. to be Samoa My first love My last My only Where the sun Is always Shining And the people Forever They smile and the rain falls gently from the heaven God bless Samoa forever Samoa The only place in the world I long to be My first love, my last, my only. O te alofa ya o e shamoa. O te tauto ya o fanua la fule mu. E pese lo anganga i le file mu male saulo tonga. Ia fa amanu ia le atua ia Samoa. Ia fa amanu ia le atua ia Samoa. Samoa. The only place in the world I long to be. Samoa. 
my first love, my last, my only. My first love, my last, my only. My first love, my last, my only.